so thank you. We go uh, to our second speaker, uh, Christoph Fraser. He's professor of pathogen dynamics at the Nutfield Department of Medicine at the University of Oxford. Uh, his research focuses on approaches to preventing infection, linking pathogen genomics, modeling, and policy communication. He has been a very active uh, in COVID response uh, and advisor to UK's Department of Health uh, throughout the pandemic. And it's really a pleasure having uh, Christoph here because he's been uh, the pioneer of uh, um, the introduction, uh, development, and evaluation of digital contact tracing. Uh, and uh, for this reason, he's also been working with uh, uh, on, on this matter with NHS, uh, Google, and Apple. Christoph, the floor is yours. Good morning. Um, well, so it's a pleasure to be able to join you. Uh, given the, the topic of, of this morning, uh, it's slightly ironic that I wasn't able to, to join you in person. I had to cancel my trip uh, on the evening before departure uh, due to being contact traced and then figuring out the, the rules um, uh, regarding travel. But it's, uh, um, so, so I miss the opportunity to be able to meet many of you in person uh, and, and to catch up, uh, but very happy to, to be able to uh, meet in person. So hopefully <clears throat> you can see my, my full slides. So I'm going to talk about the, the conception, the development and the evaluation uh, of uh, a, a digital contact tracing uh, intervention for COVID. So first of all, I'd like really like to thank uh, um, my team uh, and team's collaborators uh, academically over the, uh, uh, over the past year and a half. Uh, too many people within the NHS COVID app teams uh, over the year and a half. Um, uh, uh, and, and, but the, the, these are the main contributors uh, within my team and the collaborators at the uh, Turing Institute. And to highlight uh, Chris Wyman, uh, Luca Ferretti, David Bonzel, and, and, and Michelle Kendall in particular. So our thinking on uh, contact tracing uh, really was influenced from, from work um, um, that, that I'd done uh, together with uh, colleagues at the Imperial College and uh, uh, the University of Hong Kong, uh, where we'd studied uh, contact tracing uh, during the, the, the SARS-CoV-1 epidemic. And I think one of the, the, the really interesting lessons of, of sars coronavirus one is it, it really uh, did spread quite extensively. You can see the, the, the map of spread of cases and the number of cases, um, uh, uh, extensive local spread in, in many different countries. Uh, and the control of, of, of uh, SARS coronavirus one uh, is actually quite a remarkable story. Um, I think it was a bit of a, a dodge bullet. Um, obviously, the case fatality rate much higher at around 10%. Uh, and it was controlled by a policy, uh, systematically ap uh, applied policy of test, trace, and isolate. Um, it became um, so, so our, our perception was that contact tracing was really one of the the key public health interventions, and it was in many sort of initial containment plans. Uh, but one of the things that became apparent uh, from our work and, and from many others, really, as early as <clears throat> February 2020, is that uh, COVID was going to be different. And that was because we were seeing uh, about 50% of, of transmission occurring before symptoms. And by March 2020, there were meta-analyses uh, of different studies publishing, really showing that this was a really consistent testament. And one of the interesting things is uh, that even uh, following the, the appearance of, you know, the first mutations, the drug mutation, and then uh, the various variants of concern, the R0 is now much higher uh, than two from this initial estimate that we produced. Uh, but the, um, the role of pre-symptomatic transmission and, and symptomat uh, uh, really has been consistent. And you can see on the right, uh, this, is our, uh, this was our prediction um, from uh, uh, February uh, 2020 of the generation time. So if you follow a cohort of individuals, how many transmissions would occur in light blue from pre-symptomatic infections and in dark blue from people after they have symptoms? Of course, we now understand that the, the onset of symptoms is a rather continuous affair and that during the pre-symptomatic periods, people may in fact show sort of mild and non-characteristic cold-like uh, symptoms. One way or another, it was very clear that this was going to be a, a major problem for, for, for test, trace, and isolate policies. 
uh, together with asymptomatic infections uh, in, uh, and post symptomatic infections. So we proposed, um, uh, so we put, put those estimates into uh, mathematical models that we developed after the, the SARS epidemic in 2003. Uh, and we found that in fact, uh, containing uh, COVID or, or really making any uh, um, difference to the spread of COVID with these sorts of parameters with forwards contact tracing was going to be very difficult. Um, but um, we had the idea that we could speed up the process very substantially uh, by um, digitizing uh, the, the process. So if you could measure the proximity between individuals uh, and an extended contact and then notify those contacts instantly um, uh, after a diagnosis, um, you, could, you could speed up the process uh, and, and uh, that would uh, result in a, in a much better control uh, of infection given this uh, frequency of presymptomatic uh, transmission. There was a um, obviously, other people had previously considered uh, digital contact tracing, uh, but in this context, it resulted in very rapid uh, development uh, with the, in the UK, um, developing an app within a, a couple of days uh, of first presenting this work, uh, and then discussions with, with Google and Apple uh, that took place over, over the ensuing uh, couple of months. And you can see there the concept really is that if you, if you follow an individual throughout their infectious and symptomatic phase, by the time you're tracing uh, an individual who's, who's symptomatic and maybe taking a couple of days to then test positive, uh, the, um, the, the people, the contacts that that person may have infected are already themselves infecting people through their pre-symptomatic phases. So we're really in a situation where the, the incubation period and the generation time are, are a similar uh, duration which is really problematic uh, for this uh, um, forwards contact tracing process aiming to, to break chains of transmission. Uh, so then um, over time, uh, three, over, uh, 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 three main protocols ha ha have emerged. Uh, the, the main one uh, used around the world is the joint Apple Go Google exposure notification system uh, that was uh, based on the D3PT protocol developed by Carmelo Tronkerson and colleagues in Switzerland. In France, uh, there was a protocol that was actually uh, originally proposed for many countries in Europe uh, and used, um, deployed um, in, in, in a few countries, but uh, which is the basis of the, uh, the French uh, Toussaint Covid uh, app, and then the, the Herald and uh, Open Trace um, protocol used in, in Singapore and in the original, but not the current uh, NHS UK app. Um, so this is how the, the Google and Apple system works. Um, and step one in the top left, uh, 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 phones that have this feature are enabled, the operating systems, not the apps, uh, exchange anonymous keys uh, when a contact, an extended contact takes place. In step two, and step two has proven to be really the, the major limitation of digital contact tracing in, in, in many countries. In step two, if an individual uh, requests a test and for whatever reason tests positive, um, the individual enters the positive test result in their phone. And it turns out in many countries that this doesn't happen. Uh, people are reluctant to do this, uh, but when it works, they enter their test result into their phone uh, and they then consent to sharing their keys and their keys go onto this uh, 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 central server for 14 days. And the key thing is that there's no contact network built up by the system, which respects the privacy. And in step three, um, uh, all individuals who run the app download uh, uh, a set of keys several times a day and check whether those keys match the keys which they've got on their phone. And if they match, they receive an exposure notification. And then the app handles the rest in terms of allowing each local health authority uh, to implement a policy, be it quarantine, be it a recommendation to test, be it a recommendation to contact manual contact traces. So if you want to integrate a system in, in Switzerland, for example, uh, in order to integrate manual and contact tracing uh, systems, the recommendation is actually to contact uh, the, uh, the same team as to do manual contact tracing, such that the system can be linked uh, together. Uh, one of the things that we never really communicated with contact tracing, which is uh, um, limited, which has been difficult, 
is, is what's in it for individuals. And most people who, who participate uh, in our surveys show this, do so um, for, um, because they want to help others. But in fact, one of the things that we've never really communicated well, I think, is that contact tracing does provide uh, a direct protective effect. It's difficult to quantify. So if you imagine people, uh, somebody has contacts who are notified, and here I've illustrated a, a relatively large number of contacts, and some people are contact traced and a subset of them are infected, and some people are not contact traced. And then we worry obviously about the people who are infected, uh, but who are not contact traced, the false negatives. But there's been a lot of concern about false positives. So if you're contact traced and you're not infected, uh, and then you're particularly you're asked to quarantine, that feels quite egregious. But one of the things is that within a contact network, uh, in fact, uh, if you imagine yourself, uh, this very simple view of contact tracing on the left probably should be replaced by a view which is much more complicated, like on the right, which is that we have many contacts that we repeatedly make every day. We, you know, we see the same colleagues at work, uh, we, we go on the same public transport and so on. And so if you're contact traced, you're actually being informed that within your contact network, uh, there are infected individuals. Uh, and you're quite likely to, to meet the same people again over subsequent days. And in fact, some of the other people within that contact network, it's really an information that there's a local outbreak uh, going on. Uh, and therefore, if you're cautious for a few days, uh, that's uh, protective, that's information that may protect you uh, directly. Uh, the one thing that has been implemented in contact tracing apps is this uh, proposal that backwards tracing uh, could help find clusters. So we know that uh, infection spreads through super spreading and the backwards tracing finds clusters. Uh, and the problem is that if you implemented that based on the Bluetooth contact network, you would end up notifying many people, too many people, I think most people accepted. And therefore a, a different way in which this was implemented was through the check-in system. So the check-in system is that in venues, uh, you know, where transmission could happen, you would check in uh, uh, and people who checked in on the same day uh, would then be notified if there was an outbreak in that location uh, and asked to have a test. And one of the limitations of the check-in systems or one of the difficulties uh, is uh, that in a privacy uh, first system, um, th there was no automated way of uploading uh, the, the check-in information. Uh, and therefore, uh, this uh, information was managed by manual contact traces uh, and actually in the UK required uh, a new data system to be, to be uh, launched, which didn't operate really properly for the first six months after launch. Uh, but it did encourage, we did find that it did encourage people to use uh, the contact tracing app in the UK. We did lots of modeling and ethics works and algorithmic work to support the launch of the app. And, and uh, I'll talk about th that work is available and linked to from, from, from our website here. So I now want to talk what happened after the launch of the app. So that was sort of phase one, development of, of the app. Phase two is the launch of the app. So we launched eventually the, the NHS app based on the Google Apple system. And the core functionality really, it has turned out, uh, was contact tracing. But it also gave you uh, local information. It had the check-in system that was operational uh, 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 you know, at a high level for during the uh, early part of the Delta wave epidemic this year. You could check your systems and order a test. Uh, and there was a countdown telling you how long you needed to isolate um, when the policy was uh, isolation. Um, so you can see uh, the, the uptake of the app. Um, it was uh, about 60 to 70% of all people who could download the app uh, did so. So a large limitation is that children uh, weren't to use the app. Uh, and in uh, older populations, uh, uh, often didn't have uh, new enough uh, smartphones to, to support this system. Uh, but the, the uptake was, was pretty good amongst those who are eligible, but it was very spatially heterogeneous. And this is really you know, a key learning, given the importance of deprivation uh, in sustaining transmission, uh, that unfortunately the uptake of the app was much higher uh, in, in areas of lower deprivation, uh, as you can see on, on the map on the left, and in the inner city areas around uh, London and uh, the northeast, uh, uh, sorry, the north northwest of the country, the uptake of, of the app uh, uh, was was much lower. 
so what we did um, um, originally, you know, there was some discussion as to whether we should do a, a cluster randomized control trial, randomize some areas to have the app and others not to have the, uh, the app, which would have generated gold standard evidence. But in, in the situation uh, where it was being launched, this was considered not feasible. So we analyzed observationally uh, the data uh, relating the number of cases, uh, and we did so in, in two different phases. And this gave us a bit of a natural experiment. Um, we had two different viruses. We had the, the alpha virus uh, on the right uh, and the uh, B1, um, uh, um, an, an earlier virus uh, on the left with different geographical distribution of cases. And we were interested whether the geographical cases could be explained in part, what, what part uh, was uh, attributable to, to use uh, of the contact tracing app. You can see the, the epidemic dynamics. Um, the natural experiment comes in from the fact that the app was changed at the end of October. The algorithm was changed at the end of October, which resulted in many more notifications happening per case in phase two uh, than in phase one. The app was made a lot more sensitive uh, uh, in phase two. And uh, so these are the data on how the, the app was functioning in terms of its, its basic function. Uh, the analyzing app data is difficult because there's no linkage over time. It's entirely anonymous. So you have to fit statistical models to daily packets. So the, the app sends a little bit of data um, uh, um, to, to a central server every day. But when the app sends the data the next day, there's no way of linking it between two different days. Uh, so with a statistical model, we estimated that 6% uh, of users uh, who were notified uh, um, um, went on to themselves test positive. Um, and that was fairly high given the fact that the policy wasn't um, and was just to quarantine and, and not to order a test unless you were symptomatic. And that corresponded to roughly 7.3% for a similar process uh, for close contacts identified by manual contact tracing. It's lower than the household secondary attack rate, which is closer to, to 15%. But for reasons I'll show you in a moment, we think that most of the contacts notified by the app are non-household uh, cases. Um, so you can see with manual contact tracing uh, during the same time period, uh, and I'll come back to these, how these numbers have changed over time, manual contact tracing identified 1.8 contacts uh, uh, within two days, uh, and 1.2 of those were, were household contacts. On the other hand, the, the app identified 4.2 contacts per case uh, and did so really uh, immediately, providing a, a benefit in terms of, of contact tracing. Uh, and this, this observation, in a way, was, was surprising, is, is that despite the fact that you know, only a third of the population was using the app, uh, many more people were being notified per index case by the app than through manual contact tracing, uh, really showing, uh, I guess, either poor engagement with manual contact tracing or, or one way or another. Uh, and this may be setting specific, specific that the, the app uh, actually allowed people to have a, a better recall uh, than human recall in terms of notifying contacts. Um, so um, just in the absence of a trial, uh, we, we took uh, the uh, uh, um, approach uh, advised by Hanan and Robbins, at least as far as we, we interpreted it, which was to analyze the data as if they were a trial. Uh, many risks of confounders here, and, and our findings still have that limitation, but this is uh, how we went about trying to, to, to mitigate the, the problems of confounding. And what we did is we created matched areas, matched pairs of areas, uh, local authorities, and we matched them to have the similar trajectory of the epidemic before the app was introduced. So you can see this area right over to the east of the country, for example, would not have been included in our analysis because it didn't have uh, uh, any neighboring areas with a similar ep epidemic uh, trajectory. We then statistically adjusted for potential confounders such as poverty and rural urban score. Uh, and, and local GDP. But the, the key, key effect is really this matching on being neighboring areas. Uh, and then we looked at the difference in app uptake between those neighboring areas. So we really didn't compare different parts of the country. We only compared neighboring areas that had a similar epidemic. And we, we saw whether the difference in app uptake corresponded to difference uh, in 
um, number of cases. And when we did so, we could calculate cases averted and, and deaths averted, and the numbers uh, were, were quite large. And we did so by, by two ways. We did sort of modeling based on this second reattack rate, number of notifications, and so on. Uh, and that gave us a number of 279,000 cases averted. And that's really just through the effect of breaking the, the chains of transmission. And that gave us, uh, which also, and, and we've sort of verified that since then, in terms of a continued effect, uh, 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 roughly uh, a 13% uh, reduction in the number of cases. Uh, and at the bottom row, you can see that this spatial analysis, this statistical analysis, gave us a, a larger number of 594,000 cases averted. This was in a period where there was 1.89 um, uh, million cases, corresponding to a reduction in the number of cases of about 23.9%. Uh, um, and that, that, that statistical analysis, on the one hand, um, you know, um, could still have uh, problems of residual compounding. On the other hand, it does include these indirect effects, um, which are that being notified, even if you're not infected, may have a uh, protective effect, which we think is uh, important. Another way of looking at this in terms of policy going forwards is if you could increase app uptake in the population by 1%, how much would you reduce um, uh, cases by? And you can see that the modeling estimate is 0.79%. You would reduce the total number of cases by 0.79%, uh, and you would reduce um, the total effect estimate, uh, you would reduce the uh, uh, um, number of cases by 2.26%. Uh, and we did sensitivity analysis and different economic trick methods for doing this, which actually all gave us higher estimates than these. Uh, we, we did no, no sort of um, iterations of the analysis, which gave us uh, lower estimates. I mentioned at the beginning that there was this natural experiment. There was an upgrade to the app that made it much more sensitive. What was interesting was that the number of notifications per, uh, per case went up by a factor of 2.5 with this upgrade. And actually the, the effect size also went up by a factor of 2.5, uh, consistent with a, a causal link between uh, the uh, process of app notifications uh, and the reductions in infection rate. Just a few slides to, to show what's been going on um, uh, over the last few months since we published this. Uh, this is a graph that shows, uh, and this is, I think, really critically a difference in between um, the, what's happened in the UK with the contact tracing app and what's happened uh, in, in, in other countries. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, this is, system is used in, in 41 countries now. Um, is in the UK that the proportion of tests entered into the app has, has been very high. And this has actually been a, a real limitation of, the, of, of many of the systems. Um, and we don't have a very good explanation for why this number uh, is so high in the UK. Uh, but this is a proportion of all tests nationally uh, amongst people who are over 16 that are entered in the app. And you can see that it, it peaked over 60% uh, during the summer. So 60% so of all people who test positive uh, uh, we're entering uh, the result in the app. And it's gone down. Uh, we had some negative publicity, which I'll talk about in a moment over the summer around the pandemic. And it's now sort of stably at about 40 to, to 50%. Uh, one of the other things we've done is that you can imagine that if the app notifies contacts um, and uh, you know what proportion of those contacts are infected, uh, that can give you a reproduction number. Uh, and when comparing that to uh, other estimates of the reproduction number, uh, we also put in a regression um, uh, adjustment. Uh, so, so there is uh, a scaling factor, but you can see a very good correspondence in between the reproduction number uh, that we can estimate really in real time on that day from the app. Uh, and that produced, for example, uh, in this case, uh, well, actually this is the best agreement, uh, uh, from the, the, uh, the method uh, produced by the, 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 the group at the London uh, uh, School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. I think this is a, a key slide. Um, this is the number of contacts per, per index case. Uh, and it turns out that in, the, in, in England and Wales, this has really been the, the key difference in between manual contact tracing and, and, and app-based contact tracing. And maybe it argues that manual contact tracing could, could, could have done a lot more than it, it's done. Um, but what we see is 
Um, and this, this is a period, uh, uh, the end of the, the winter wave, the alpha wave at the left, and, and the beginning of the delta wave um, uh, uh, at the right. And what you can see is that the app um, reflects the contact rates that people actually have. Uh, because what happened was that we had a staged reopening of society. And every time we went through one stage, we had phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four, reopening of the society. And every time we went through a phase of reopening of society, we see a, an increase in contact rates. And one of the things we observed was that the biggest change was actually in, in phase three. So when there was a lot of policy discussion going on about the full opening of society phase four, we could actually see that the contact rates had already increased with phase three, which was explaining why Delta was spreading so rapidly. You can also see uh, in orange, the number of people that were, that were reached by the manual contact tracing actually peaked when there were containment efforts for Delta, um, which didn't contain uh, the Delta wave. And in fact, as Delta started spreading more, manual contact tracing became less effective We've now less than two people notified uh, per case. People just don't re re report their cases to, to, to manual contact tracing, whereas the app uh, actually scaled up. So this is what resulted in, in the pandemic is that people were having more contacts. The app was working, notifying more contacts per case, and uh, the epidemic was spreading as a result of both the increased infectiousness of Delta and people having more contacts. Um, interestingly, there's been a decline since then, which has two phenomena. One is that there has been a, 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 a process of people sort of deleting the app over the, the last few months following adverse publicity. They're not as much um, as, is, as is publicized, maybe about 20% reduction uh, in, in, in um, relative in, in proportion of people using the app. But actually, we've seen a very marked reduction in contact rates over the last few months with something you know, uh, many workplaces still um, um, uh, closed uh, and so on, which has been rather paradoxical. Um, just to, to finish uh, mentioning the, the pandemic. So these were the, the headlines over the summer. Um, difficult now, considering the situation we're in, to know whether, you know, what role Brexit might have played in, in, in this as well. Um, but following the, the football tournament, we saw a huge wave of transmission. And one of the things we, we saw with the app is that the transmission that occurred, the secondary attack rate was really much higher during um, people watching football, presumably watching football at home, which resulted in many people uh, being isolated uh, and uh, uh, headlines, negative headlines um, um, about the pandemic over the course of the summer. Uh, and what we're analyzing now is uh, how much of an effect, it wasn't the only thing that happened, look, it was very busy, uh, July, but how much of an effect that had on the epidemic curve. Uh, and it's worth pointing out that in the middle of July, uh, uh, the SAGE FIAM um, committee, modeling committee, said that, you know, uh, it was certain that we were going to reach 100,000 cases a day and that things would get really problematic, uh, but it was reasonably possible that we would reach 200,000 cases a day. Instead, uh, the epidemic has been completely flat over the summer at about 30 to 40,000 cases per day. And there was this very sudden reduction. And that sudden reduction, uh, if you look, happened uh, just at the time when we were having um, the pandemic. So really the question is how much of a contribution uh, was, was that? And it's quite interesting because uh, uh, what, about one and a half million people got contact traced over the course of the week after these football matches. The secondary attack rate was very high. Uh, and it is possible that this was a bit like a spontaneous uh, lockdown around the young people uh, who were uh, uh, watching uh, the football. So maybe unpopular, but uh, effective. Just to finish on the international outlook, uh, these are my concluding slides. Google and Apple uh, is used in 41 countries and 21 US states. It is a privacy first trusted system. Uh, I think it has a proven potential for supporting and enhancing test race and isolate system. Uh, and in fact, it's turned out that the main benefit is the breadth of, of tracing. Individual recall of contacts is not good. I think we've now proven that. Uh, automated systems outperform humans on the recall of contacts. However, then when it comes to the behavioral aspect, internationally, we've seen limitations of the system as well. Integration with testing is variable and often poor. Uh, stretch testing systems uh, have been reluctant to engage with this in many jurisdictions. 
Integration with manual tracing is rare, though both Singapore and Switzerland have done this well. And has not been used very often or very well, and I haven't talked about it here. And some of the Asian apps uh, are really impressive, and I haven't talked about them, Don't not using the Google Apple system, but they are harder to evaluate within the context of an overall successful containment policy. So where there was a COVID zero policy, it's very hard to ascribe um, the success to any one intervention. I would single out the 98% app plus device adoption in Singapore that must have had an impact. Uh, and the Indian app, uh, Aragya Setu, uh, really did, uh, during the first wave before Delta, really was very interesting. And it will be very, I think, uh, important to see uh, what the impact of, 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 of that intervention in India was. And that was also well integrated, really helped uh, teams on the ground uh, locate uh, their interventions. Uh, one of the things going forwards is I don't think this should be developed independently within tech. But I think, you know, contact tracing is a complex intervention, and we want this to be able to assist that complex contact tracing intervention. Um, and, and a lot of the ethical quandaries and discussions uh, really should have a public voice heard within that. We're still in the early days of what could be done. Um, we will have in the future, for sure, better sensor, better algorithms, innovative network analysis, and linking it to rapid tests is really interesting for speeding up the system. Uh, with manual contact tracing, we use contact tracing to learn about the risk of transmission, about the importance of different settings, uh, about the infectiousness of new variants. We've seen findings this week published about using contact tracing to look at the impact of vaccination on transmission. Um, the apps don't give us any of this information uh, in their current configuration, uh, but working out how to get that kind of information in a privacy preserving manner using federated uh, uh, algorithms is, is something that, that could be considered and is possible in theory. It will be interesting to see whether it can be done in practice. Um, but for that kind of thing, we need to plan ahead to have greater impact uh, on the epidemic. So thank you for listening. Um, thanks to the NHS app teams, which have contributed uh, you know, uh, 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 over, over the months. And again, thanks to my research team. Thank you. is open for questions. Simon Kershmez from uh, Institute Pasteur. Hi, Christophe. Uh, thanks a lot. Great talk. Uh, so you're talking about the future of these apps. Uh, in which settings do you think that we could use it? So is it for, you know, future emerging pathogens or could you think about other, mm -hmm. like, a, you know, for, in a flu epidemic, should we start considering using these apps? So, so there was a commitment uh, by Google and Apple only to to support the apps um, um, during during this uh, sorry to the, the exposure notification uh, for for this pandemic uh, and therefore that system will be discontinued. Um, the the criteria for discontinuing it um, uh, you know uh, are, are are under discussion between Google, Apple, and, and the the health authorities. Um, uh, but so, so there's that commitment. Um, the, the second question, I think, is, is one um, which needs to be thought about. So in terms of, I mean, the ideal situation is really to be able to, to enhance uh, contact tracing at the outbreak levels before we're thinking uh, about pandemics, so to try and deploy them uh, as quickly as, as possible. So having a standing capacity that would be um, able to do that uh, would be useful. But actually, also, you can imagine that early on in an outbreak, um, that's also where you want to have the, the, the manual uh, contact tracing, um, uh, uh, you know, standing capacity. I think, I think we've all learned that we would, you know, like to maximize our chances of, of early containment when we, when we start seeing the first uh, cases. I do think um, if, if the trust can be built up, you can imagine that in an outbreak situation, uh, um, the, the kind of system that, that's been used in, in Singapore uh, with um, you know, uh, wearable tokens and so on uh, could, could be useful uh, within the context of, of local outbreak surveillance. But we also really need to, to look very carefully at, on the behavioral side because, or, uh, and the trust side, because we know that, that maintaining trust early on in an outbreak 
is, is also uh, really important. So I think there needs to be a, a careful behavioral evaluation uh, on that side. I do think there is scope for um, you know, apps that provide more individual value for users, which could be considered for a range of respiratory pathogens, you know, things which are more like the sort of citizen science uh, uh, apps. Uh, with, where people volunteer to, to you know, provide more information uh, in order to, to help us understand better the range of respiratory pathogens uh, is one thing uh, that, that's also being discussed and I, I think would be very interesting. Thank you. We have one more question from the audience. Yes, good morning. Thank you for your presentation. Arnaud Tarantola, from, uh, formerly from Pasteur and now with Santé Publique France. Um, the, um, I, I stepped out for a minute, so perhaps uh, apologies if I missed this, but you describe the effectiveness of the app in identifying contacts. Um, do you have any data on the app's effectiveness in getting those contacts to get tested? Um, as you showed the pandemic and the reduction in cases identified, was this because people self-contained or because they stopped getting tested? Um, that's, that's one part of the data that was unable to see. And follow-up question, were you, are you able in, um, in, in real time to identify super spreading events or venues? Uh, so the, the second, uh, no, we weren't able to identify super spreading events or venues. So the, the, to identify the super spreadings or venues would have been based on the QR code check-in system. Uh, but as I mentioned, that um, didn't produce high, high you know, um, uh, wasn't used very much uh, for, for the first few months of the app because uh, the, the, the privacy um, system was that essentially an individual would have to read out uh, to manual contact tracers uh, the list of venues um, that they've uh, attended uh, and it, it, it wasn't considered um, sort of private enough to, to automate that, that process. Uh, and so that, that contributed, I think, to, to, to the manual tracing system for looking uh, uh, at, at locations uh, with super spread events. But that, um, that's something which I think could and should be done better for the, the future. Uh, for the, the looking at, at testing after the, the pandemic, um, it's, it's a difficult question in terms of what happens to people after they get notified. We did see, um, we, we do um, see positive tests uh, that happen and we did see a, a large increase in people uh, testing positive, so in the second reattack attack rate uh, after, after the pandemic. Uh, so people were testing uh, a very big jump in 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 people testing positive, um, and we also have the um, uh, the the two surveys: the Office for National Statistics survey and the React survey, which suggest that the reductions in infection rates um, were um, and there was definitely a reduction in infection rate after the pandemic. But part of the reason why this analysis is complicated and still ongoing is that there were changes also in, in testing. There was the start of the school holidays and there was also people sort of arranging their testing to maximize their chance of being able to, uh, to go on holiday uh, over the summer. So it was a very complex period. Uh, and I would just say that the app was one of the factors uh, that, that contributed uh, to, to the strange dynamics, uh, but, but we're still exploring that actively. Well, thank you very much, Christoph. Thank you.